Welcome to our talk on the wildflowers of the upland areas. I'm Anthony McCluskey, the Helping Hands for Butterflies project officer. And Helping Hands for Butterflies is a project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and by Nature Scott. And this lesson will cover many of the plants which are only found in upland areas of Scotland, but we'll also cover some of those which are typically found at sea level, such as those at peatlands, which can also be found in upland areas too. And the uplands have so many different habitats within them. One type of habitat is blanket bog. It's a type of habitat which is only found in the cool, wet places of the world. Those conditions mean the plants break down very slowly when they die and it forms peat. Peat can build up to very high levels and it can be up to eight meters deep in some places and up to 6,000 years old. Now, much of the uplands have blanket bog, which was created whenever people cleared the land thousands of years ago, but in other areas of Scotland, such as the flow country of Caithness and Sutherland, blanket bog would have developed naturally. The peat can trap a lot of carbon in the ground and there's actually more carbon stored in the world's peatlands than in the world's forests. There's also heathland and moorland, which is dominated by heathers or grasses. These tend to be drier than bogs and they again developed through the clearance of trees thousands of years ago. And then there's scree, which tends to be steep land where rocks can fall. This can be a really excellent habitat for many different wildflowers, which sometimes don't get a chance to grow through the grass. So whenever the land is disturbed this way, those wildflowers can pop up. And there's also a type of ancient woodland called the Caledonian pinewood. This once covered much of the Scottish Highlands, and now there's only about 5% of this remaining. And many of the plants found in upland areas belong in the heath family, also known as the Ericaceae. And this family of plants uh, varies greatly. Most of them are small shrubs with woody stems. They tend to have evergreen leaves and urn-shaped flowers. And it does include some garden plants like rhododendron, azalea, heathers and blueberries. And they're mostly found in acidic and infertile soils. So let's have a look at heathers first of all, because heathers dominate much of the uplands of Scotland, and there are three main species in Scotland. The first one we look at is called common or ling heather, and this can be found in a variety of different habitats. It tends to dominate in heaths, moors, bogs and woodland, so it's found in wet, dry and in wet places. And the flowers of this plant tend to be pale pink, and they are arranged all along the stems, as you can see in the photograph here. And the petals are quite separated. So unlike some of the other heathers, which are more urn-like, you can see clearly the petals here are quite well separated. And the leaves themselves are very short, um, only one to two millimeters long, and they overlap. So the leaves are quite distinctive. You can see them here arranged all along the stem, these very small leaves of this plant. Then there's bell heather, and this tends to prefer drier heathland. And the flowers for this plant tend to be mostly at the top, but can sometimes be along the stem too. And they have a distinctly bell-like appearance, which tends to be a darker purple in color than that of ling heather. And the leaves are very different as well. So they're longer, up to five to seven millimeters long, and they are shiny green in appearance with no hairs on them. So if you compare those two photographs here, you can see that they're very different in the leaves and in the flowers. The final one we'll look at today is called cross-leaved heath, and this prefers wetter habitats, including bogs, wet heaths, and moorland. And the flowers for this species tend to only be at the very ends of the stems. As you can see in the photograph here, they're all gathered at the end and they're distinctly bell-like. So again, it's, it's, it's urn-shaped, urn very similar to those of bell heather. And they tend to be a, a paler pink though than those of bell heather. If you look at, then closely at the leaves, they are hairy with the margins are curled over. So if you compare that to the bell heather, you can see that the leaves are distinctly hairy and the margins are curl, curved over underneath. So that's how to separate the three main species of heather in Scotland, which are all very good nectar sources for insects, but are also used by the caterpillars of various moth species, including the emperor moth. Staying with the Ericaceae then, we'll look at a plant called blaeberry, also sometimes known as bilberry. And this is Scotland's blueberry because it produces these delicious blueberries later in summer. 
Well, whenever it's in bloom, the flowers are cup shaped. Um, they're red and they all point downwards. So you can see the red flowers here with the really large opening and pointing downwards from the stem. And they can grow in clumps, which are up to 50 centimeters tall. And you can see the many uh, vertical stems here, all covered in the red flowers of this plant. They tend to have these vivid green leaves, and they can be found in a number of different habitats, such as open moorland, bogs, and even woodland edges, as you can see in the photograph here. It's the main caterpillar food plant for a butterfly called the green hair streak. And the green hair streak is one of Scotland's three hair streak species, and these all tend to have a short tail on the hind wing. You can see just this little tail here in the green hair streak. The Latin name for green hair streak is califris, which means beautiful eyebrows. And this little butterfly always rests with its wings shut, so we only ever see the underside of the butterfly. However, the upper wings are brown and quite silvery in appearance whenever they're in flight. Yet whenever the butterfly lands, they close their wings immediately and it can make them very good, uh, very difficult to spot because they're very well camouflaged against the leaves of blaeberry or other nearby plants. These emerge in springtime and they can be very well camouflaged against blaeberry or birch leaves. And they're found around the UK and the rest of the world. And they can use many different plants for their caterpillars in those locations, including gorse, dogwood, birds with trefoil, rock rose and buckthorn and many other plants. However, in Scotland, they're mostly associated with places where blaeberry grows, but they might also use gorse in some coastal areas. This is a fairly widespread species in Scotland, but never very numerous. You can look for it in sunny places which tend to be sheltered from the wind, so they're quite warm, and they which have blaeberry as well. So if you look at the map, you can see some of the locations where you can find the green hair streak. And it's usually flying from May until June. And they're fairly small butterflies, so really you're looking for a silvery fluttering thing. And then if you get close whenever it lands, you'll see that it has this beautiful iridescent green appearance to it. Staying with the Ericaceae then, we're looking at a plant called crowberry. And this is an evergreen shrub forming very dense low mats over the ground. As you can see in the photograph here, it doesn't grow very tall really. It's found in more open spaces such as mountains, moors and the drier parts of peatlands. The flowers themselves are really tiny, but it's very easy to identify this species because it has these black berries, which are very distinctive and very easy to spot over, over the leaves of this plant. Now we come on to two very similar plants, cowberry and bearberry. They're not very closely related, however, they have very similar leaves, flowers and fruits, so we'll spend some time looking at these. Now cowberry, this is the general appearance of it here. You'll sometimes just see it growing over, uh, over bits of moss or other vegetation. So it's a, a very low growing woody shrub. And if you look at the flowers then, the flowers spread out towards the opening. So here's the opening of the flower and you'll see the petals just opening towards the outer bit there. And the leaves tend to be a glossy green with clear grooves of veins on the upper surface, as you can see in the photo here. But you'll notice that it has red berries and that's very similar to the next plant we'll look at. So bearberry also has these green leaves, uh, as you can see here, and the very red berries. And has a very similar overall appearance to cowberry in that it's also a very low growing shrub. However, if you look at the flowers then, they tighten to a kind of a waist, so it's distinctly urn shaped uh, and they do that before they open just towards the outer bit there. So the two flowers are, are quite different. And the leaves then tend to be leathery and they are net veined on the undersides of the leaves. So it's cowberry and bearberry. But the, one of the reasons why bearberry is important is because it's the main caterpillar food plant of the netted mountain moth. This species is a conservation priority for us in Scotland because the entire UK population is found here, as you can see on the map. These are the, the locations where it's found. The species might be threatened by tree planting and encroachment from taller vegetation because the caterpillar food plants are so low growing that they really can't compete whenever there are larger plants around because they can't get the light that they need. 
So the netted mountain moth, though, is very similar to the very commonly found common heath moth. So what you're looking for are adults flying during the day around Bearberry and in the month of May. So do try to get a photo, though, and send it to us for verification. Now we're on to a different family of plants now, and we're on to the mint family, which includes thyme. So the only this is the only species of wild thyme found in Scotland. It's found in areas of short grass in full sun, in neutral or alkaline soils. So therefore, it's absent from PT areas, which tend to be acidic. You can also find it on rock ledges and on rocky highland streams. So places with very poor rocky soil. It can form these large hummocks of pale flowers. As you can see here, just above the grass, it's formed this hummock here, where you can see the pale lilac colored flowers. The leaves then are small and round, and there are a few other plants for this combination of this very small round leaves with the lilac flowers held like this. The leaves don't taste or smell very strongly of thyme, which is used in cooking though, so don't expect it to smell like thyme, which we're used to. It's a very important nectar plant for butterflies and moths and other insects in these upland areas. Now, harebell then is sometimes also known as the Scottish bluebell, but it's in a completely different family to the regular bluebell, which tend to be found in woodlands. And the botanical name for this is Campanula rotundifolia, so it's related to the garden varieties of Campanulas, are also known as bellflowers. And many of those garden varieties have actually escaped in Scotland, so you can find them in the wild, but this is the only Campanula species which looks like this. It has pale purple blue flowers which tend to be quite large compared to the size of the stem and they mostly face downwards but it has these very fine thin stalks here holding these very large flowers and most of the leaves are at the bottom of the plant. This is a very widespread plant found in a large range of habitats including uplands, lowlands and in coastal places but tends not to be found in damp ground so it prefers more well-drained soil. Then there's common rock rose, another plant which prefers very well-drained soil. So this plant is, the, the name is confusing because it's not even within the family of real roses. It is found in a variety of different places, mostly in areas with very short grass, but never in acidic places such as peat bogs. And you can find it in scree, hillsides, cliffs, coasts, and in short grassland. And this is a very typical site in some places where it's sunny, sometimes south facing, and it gets a lot of sunlight. And you can see these large yellow flowers just here. Those flowers are distinctive. They're bright yellow, and they are about two centimeters across and held on these little stems. The main stems, though, grow across the ground and it's quite a woody shrub towards the bottom. However, the flowering stems tend to be softer and less woody. The flowers do look similar to those of St. John's Worts, which are also yellow, large and have five petals. But no St. John's Worts have woody stems which go across the ground. So the common rock rose is distinctive for this reason. You can also find it as a garden plant, sometimes with different coloured flowers, but it's also the main caterpillar food plant for a butterfly called the northern brown argus. And we'll just have a look at that species now. This species is quite interesting because it was first described from specimens found in Holyrood Park in the centre of Edinburgh in the 1700s. So it has a claim to being Edinburgh's own butterfly. However, it's not only found in Edinburgh and most of its distribution is in wide uh, parts of Scotland. You can see it goes the whole way from Dumfries and Galloway, right through the borders, um, then the highlands and up into the Murray coast around there. However, even though it was found in Edinburgh, it was actually extinct there at Holyrood within a hundred years. This is because of habitat destruction and possibly because of collection by butterfly collectors. Yet over a decade ago, it was re-found at Holyrood Park along some stretches which are actually very close to the roads. So it can be seen flying there now. And it flies from June until July. Other populations of the species are threatened by encroachment from trees and shrubs because the plants that it feeds upon really need a lot of sunlight. Also tree planting schemes and in some places overgrazing are threatening this butterfly too. So it's a priority for conservation work in Scotland as it has been lost for much of its previous range. 
Now, we're looking at a plant within the viola genus, and this is mountain pansy. There are others within the family too, which can be found in Scotland, including the field pansy, common dog violet, and marsh violet. But this would be one of the commonest ones in drier parts of the uplands. The flowers then can be yellow or violet or a mixture of both. And they tend to be quite large, up to three and a half centimetres across. And they're usually found in areas of very short grass, oftentimes with rocks underneath. So it's a, it's a plant which really prefers those drier habitats and rocky soils. And it's one of the caterpillar food plants of some of the fertility butterflies. And some of those fertilities also use a plant called bracken, which is actually within the fern plant family, so it isn't a flowering plant. So we'll start off by looking at how to identify it. It's quite distinctive with a single long straight stem coming from the ground with sprays of typical fern-like leaves at the tops of these strong stems. It's a caterpillar food plant for the brown silverline moth, which is a species which can be very numerous around bracken in May. But bracken also can provide almost a type of a woodland for common dog violet and primrose and other woodland plants on otherwise exposed hillsides. That's because it really shades the sun and it can favour the growth of some of these plants which require more shading than would they would otherwise get on these exposed hillsides. So dead bracken then can be important for the life cycle of butterflies such as pearl border fritillaries because it, whenever it dies and it remains on the ground and it gets heated by the sun, it can be up to 20 degrees Celsius warmer than the surrounding grass. So the caterpillars of some species will then bask upon the bracken and it warms them up and it helps them to, to digest their food. So even though bracken can be invasive in some places, it seems to be important for some of these species which require it in uh, in a mixed habitat. And one of the species which is often associated with bracken then is the pearl border fritillary, which tends to emerge in the month of May in Scotland. And it will lay its eggs upon plants within the viola family, including, including the common dog violet and mountain pansies. Then those caterpillars will feed for a while. So the little black caterpillars here feeding upon the dog violet leaf. They will feed for as long as they can, but then when winter comes, they they stop feeding and they'll go to the base of the plant. So they'll remain there through the winter. Then whenever spring comes, they can resume feeding on the viola leaves and the caterpillars are larger at this stage. Now to help the caterpillars digest their food, they can actually feed for a while, then they'll crawl off into the onto the dead bracken and the heat being emitted from the dead bracken can warm these caterpillars up and it really helps them to, to digest their food and to develop quickly enough to become a butterfly. So eventually then they form a chrysalis and they will then emerge as beautiful butterflies around the month of May. So this is a typical life cycle of the pearl border fritillary. Now we look at a plant now called Tormentil, um, and this plant is very common in Scottish uplands and in lowlands, and it's quite a distinctive one. It has very small flowers, only up to 15 millimetres across. Those are a bright pale yellow, and they can have four or five petals with a notch in the middle. You can see in the photograph here, just this little notch here, which helps you to identify it from other species. And it has these toothed leaves as well. Now there are several other related species in Scotland with a similar appearance to Tormentil, but regular Tormentil is by far the most widespread and common. Other similar species are creeping sinkfoil and trailing Tormentil, but both of those have thin stems which trail across the ground and they aren't shrubby and leafy like the Tormentil is. It's a useful nectar plant for various insects and it's, uh, it's a very common plant in many of these areas. Now, bog asphodel, as its name suggests, is more associated with peat bogs and other wet habitats. It's quite a distinctive plant. There aren't any others like it within the UK. So it has starry yellow flowers, which open after midsummer. And you can see the beautiful starry yellow flowers just here, and they're quite distinctive. And they're held on these short stalks. It's a very useful plant for nectar for insects and for pollen too. And in some of these wet places, you might also see sundews. These are carnivorous plants which actually use a sticky glue on their leaves to catch and consume small invertebrates. There are three species which are found in Scotland. The most widespread one would be round leaf sundew, and then there's also great sundew, which is slightly less common. 
And you can see from the photograph here, this is round leaf sundew. So in this one, you are looking for the rounded leaves, which are distinctly almost like a table tennis bat. So quite a distinct round leaf with the uh, with these little globules of glue on it, which can be used to catch the insects. Then if you're looking for greater sundew, it tends to have more elongated leaves. So they're much longer in appearance and very different to those of the round leaf sundew. Both of these could be found in sunny open spaces, but in wet habitats such as bogs. Then butterworts are another carnivorous plant uh, and these have sticky leaves which trap small insects uh, such as the, the famous Scottish midge. So you can see here it doesn't have the big globules unlike the sundews, however the leaves, the leaves are still sticky and will catch smaller insects like this. And there are two species of butterworts found in Scotland. There's common butterwort, and which is much more widespread. And then there's the pale butterwort. So common butterwort is distinctive by having bright green leaves like this and blue flowers. Pale butterwort though has paler green leaves and a pale pink flower and it's much less common than this one. And you can look for those in open wet places. Now in Scotland, there are two main species of cotton grasses associated with heathland and bogs. There's the common cotton grass and the flowers for this emerge early in spring and they're fairly insignificant. This plant is much more recognizable whenever it has this cotton like head and this is the seed head and these tend to appear from late spring onwards. So the seeds are all contained at the ends of these little threads and this will be used for the, for the seeds to fly to new habitats. This species can be identified because it has several seed heads at the top of a stem and also has this upward pointing leaf at the top of the stem too. Now in this photograph then we're looking at hare's tail cotton grass. Again the flowers emerge in early spring and they're quite small and it's much more distinctive then whenever the cotton heads appear from late spring onwards and whole bogs can be covered in the cotton grass. You can separate this species from common cotton grass because it has single seed heads at the top of a stem with no pointing leaves near the seeds. So they're quite unlike those of common cotton grass. There are no leaves just pointing up behind the seed heads and they all tend to be single instead of the multiple, as multiple ones you can see hanging from the, the common cotton grass here. Hair steel cotton grass is the caterpillar food plant of the large heath butterfly. And we can have a look at that one now because it's one of our priority species for conservation. So this is only found in boggy habitats in northern parts of the UK where hare's tail cotton grass grows. So as you can see here in this in this bog, it has hare's tail cotton grass dotted throughout it. There are three subspecies of large heath known from the UK and two of them are found in Scotland. So you can see them illustrated here. The subspecies Davis tends to be found in more southerly parts and has really distinctive black spots, eye spots on the underwings. And then as you get further north, they have fewer spots on the wings. So subspecies Scotica tends to be found in more northerly parts of the UK. And in Scotland, we only get Polydama and Scotica. These can be similar to the small heath, which is a much more widespread species, but the small heaths can be found in any grassy habitat, whereas large heath is only ever found in these wet habitats where, where these bogs occur. And small heath never has spots on the lower wings. Now some of our upland butterflies and moths are experiencing some threats. There are some species which are only found in upland areas, such as the mountain ringlet, which is only found in mountains and over 350 meters in elevation. So it has the majority of its distribution in parts of the highlands in Scotland where these mountains occur. Some of the mountain species can be specialized to feed on only certain plants and the mountain ringlet will mostly feed upon nardus grass and other grasses which are fi very fine leaved grasses found in these upland areas. However, climate change is changing the plant communities in these places, so lowland grasses are now creeping up the hillsides, so it might begin to push our mountain ringlets further and further up the hills as they go in search of their caterpillar food plants, but eventually those, those butterflies might find that there's nowhere else to go, so those species are at risk of climate change changing the plant communities that they depend upon. 
We also have the risk of large forestry plantations, and these can cover large areas uh, of the uplands, and there are some targets for even greater coverage. Now, even though we do need forestry, oftentimes it is very dense, so no wildflowers can grow underneath it, um, and it, it makes it a very inhospitable place for insects such as butterflies. Some areas of the landscape are covered in huge areas of forestry with very little in between. However, there are some opportunities and some butterflies are actually beginning to thrive in the way leaves and paths within these, within these forestry and they just need to be maintained for those butterflies then. And we do work with other agencies such as the Forestry and Land Scotland to avoid the planting of trees on land used by the priority species of butterflies and moths. We're also part of projects such as the Rare Invertebrates of the Cairngorms, which is a project looking at some of the rarest insects in the UK, including species like the Kentish Glory Moth and the Dark Bordered Beauty. And we have a project called Bog Squad. Now this mostly works in lowland areas on peat bogs, and it's a project to restore those bogs, which can help species of butterflies such as the large heath. This is because 94% of our lowland raised bogs have been lost across the UK. They've been lost to drainage for agriculture, tree planting and peat extraction for compost. The volunteers then are removing the trees from the bogs, even native trees like birch and Scots pine, as those can dry the bogs out and cause them to degrade. And they also put in uh, these dams. So they dam up the ditches which have been dug into the bogs. And these dams hold back the water and make the bogs much more uh, like uh, a much more intact habitat. And it favours the growth of sphagnum moss and the slow decay of plants, which helps to build the bogs. So those are just some of the plants you can find in uplands and some of the ways that butterfly conservation is helping our upland butterflies and moths.